Hi, I'm Lynn Swanson. I'm the Cultural Collections Manager at MSU Museum. And we're going to tell you a little bit about how we care for collections. We practice preventive conservation here at MSU Museum. And we do that by providing a stable environment of about 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 40% humidity for the artifacts. Because if you get changing humidity and temperature, it can cause swelling and shrinking of fibers, which, cause, uh, which could cause permanent damage to artifacts. We also use museum quality steel cabinets or closed cabinets. Um, and these are great because they protect from dust and pests and uh, light. And I have a couple examples of damage that can be caused by pests in particular. Um, I don't know if you can see this. It's a quill work and birch bark mat that has been attacked by pests and the pests have eaten all the quills off there, leaving the birch bark intact. An example of light damage is this beautiful strawberry basket. It used to be a sort of fuchsia, pink and red, now faded from light on the exterior to light pink. So these are things we watch for. Another thing is um, for fragile items, we make storage supports. Um, this is great because it gives support for the object in storage when it's resting in the cabinet, but also makes a way for you to lift it and handle it without touching the object. In this case, it's a Victorian era black ash purse, and we made a little pillow for it out of muslin and batting, and it's, um, the black ash curls are, won't be crushed with that method. We also use um, polyethylene foam uh, lined with Tyvek. And one more example, this is a more um, sturdy piece, it's newer, but it's top heavy and has a very small base. So we made this cradle out of polyethylene foam lined with Tyvek and it can stand up uh, on its own. Um, so those are just a, a couple of the things we do to protect collections behind the scenes. I just wanted to point out this fantastic collection that we recently acquired from Catherine Vale, who was a lifetime collector of quill work in Michigan. She lived in Ohio, but had a, a cottage up in Indian River, Michigan. So over a 40 to 50 year period, she collected quill boxes from just multiple artists, uh, many of whom are, are still living. And um, the collection includes 168 pieces. This is a tufted quill work. It's gonna be the subject of exhibitions and, and research. When we received the collection, we, um, we had a student, Judy Piersnowski, a Native American student who, who also herself is a quill worker. So it was really helpful to have her help us um, catalog them all and do research on the families and even you know, look at the patterns and try to see how they were passed through families. Um, we always love to have, give opportunities to students to work in collections behind the scenes, especially in cataloging and research. Judy was working also with Dr. Heather Howard in the Department of Anthropology. They were trying to perfect um, a way to do 3D imaging of some of these boxes so they can be seen in the round, or you know, in three dimensions, online, and that's an ongoing project. We're trying to get those all digitized and prepared. So this cabinet represents some of our older uh, specimens of Native American basketry. Um, these probably date to about the 1880s to the turn of the 20th century, and probably mostly made for the tourist trade. Um, although there are some fantastic pieces in here that were made for use by Native people, including these, what they call muskamut. These are made out of basswood. They're woven. We have three examples. But some, you can tell that some of these more curly ones made for sale to um, non-Native people. Uh, we received most of these collections in about the 1950s. 
Um, one large group of them came in 1952 when we received the entire contents of the Chamberlain Warren Museum from Three Oaks, Michigan. Um, and they had collected them in about the 1920s. I'm Dr. Marcia McDowell, and I'm curator of folk arts and quilt studies here at the Michigan State University Museum. I'm also a professor in the Department of Art, Art History, and Design, and I direct a statewide program called the Michigan Traditional Arts Program. So I am going to talk about um, some of the things that are on this table, but I'm going to connect them to uh, information about how we acquired them and why we acquired them in order to give some kind of understanding about how our collections are built and how we use them. So um, I think you will have just seen some of the historical things in uh, the Anishinaabe uh, collections that we have here in the museum. And Lynn spoke about how we acquired those and the fact that they date to even to the 1880s. And what we're talking about here is not the archeological collections that the MSG Museum also owns, but the um, material culture object collections that date mostly after contact um, and more contemporary things as well. So you just saw some of those older pieces that were acquired through donations and through um, acquisition of uh, the collections of a museum that closed in Michigan. I'm going to talk about things that are, for the most part, uh, derived from research-based uh, projects and from collaborations with Native peoples and organizations in Michigan, and a little bit uh, in terms of a partnership with the Smithsonian Institution's uh, National Museum of the American Indian. So, um, so let me just say that uh, one of the first things that uh, we were starting to acquire as part of programs that we ran with the Michigan Traditional Arts Program were items that were made by artists in Michigan who were participants in two programs that the Michigan Traditional Arts Program runs. One is called the Michigan Heritage Awards Program, and one is the Michigan Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program. The Heritage Award Program recognizes individuals who are uh, nominated by members of their community as being the best at what they are doing, and also individuals who have a strong commitment to perpetuating their art form and the cultural knowledge that the um, piece embodies. Uh, this would be a good example of such an item. Uh, this called a porcupine quill or porcupine basket, not a porcupine quill, but a porcupine basket, uh, was made by Edith Bondi, who lived in the northern part of the Lower Peninsula. And uh, she made a number of these baskets all out of black ash and perfectly round uh, shapes. And uh, her, her craftsmanship was extraordinary. This Smithsonian has at least one example of the work of Edith Bundy, but she got one of those Michigan Heritage Awards. So she was, we acquired it because she got one of those awards, and we wanted to have an example, and this is important, of contemporary Native artwork and cultural materials. Uh, obviously, the historical collection is wonderful that we have here, but it didn't convey the fact that these traditions are still carried on today by people, Anishinaabe people living here in the state. So this is, this is a good example of a Heritage Award connected item. We also uh, ran the Michigan Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program, and in that program, uh, the a master artist and an apprentice 
applied for funds to the Michigan Traditional Arts Program to conduct an apprenticeship, um, usually several months long, by in which the master artist would teach some skills to a, not a complete novice, but a student who was really interested in learning that skill and was making a commitment to continuing to do that within whatever cultural community. A good example is of that kind of, of um, project award and connected to an artist is uh, this cool box, which is, you saw the ones um, upstairs in the cabinets. Um, this one is a three-dimensional one. The quills of the porcupine that's depicted on the top of this box are actually sticking out. So it's a three-dimensional porcupine quill. Uh, work art piece, and Rita Corbier, uh, originally from Manitoulin Island, and she made this as part of an apprenticeship program with us under our grant program. Uh, that program is not no longer based at the MSU Museum, but the objects and the field work and all of the um, uh, photographs, etc., tape-recorded interviews are part of the Michigan State University Museum Collection, and they are um, regularly used. So there was, uh, there was two programs that uh, we run that we uh, continue to try and acquire pieces of individual artist work that show uh, diverse kinds of traditional skills that are still being carried on here the, um, in Michigan. So then another early uh, acquisition for us in terms of more contemporary Anishinaabek art was the quilt that you see in front of you. And that was part of a documentation project called the Michigan Quilt Project, started in the mid-1980s. and culminated in um, a exhibition and a publication. And you'll see that a quilt very similar to the one on the table was the cover of this publication. That, that quilt, both of those quilts, were documented in what we call Community Quilt Discovery Days that we held in probably over 30, maybe over 40, communities around Michigan where people brought collections in, uh, brought uh, quilts in to have them measured, photographed, written descriptions of the physical properties of the quilt. And then all of that data came into the MSU Museum, again, a Michigan traditional arts program. And we have all of that documentation here. Well, as it turned out, this quilt had a story that was associated with it that the owner of the quilt said was um, that this quilt had been made by an Odawa quilt maker. And we quickly consulted with some colleagues who were specializing in Woodlands art. They were confirming that story. And then lo and behold, at uh, that one of the next quilt discovery days that we did, we um, also saw another quilt like that that had a similar story. The uh, owners, separate owners of each of these quilts decided that those quilts would have a good home for them at Michigan State University because we had already been out in the community demonstrating interest, research interest in these materials. So both of those were donated, um, but they were associated with research projects. By the way, we have probably over um, eight, 9,000 quilts made in Michigan that have been documented through the Michigan Quilt Project. So those were some of the first forays into um, collecting contemporary uh, American Indian materials, specifically from Michigan. And one thing led to another, and we started doing projects in collaboration with 
um, Native organizations and individuals. One of them was called Sisters of the Great Lakes. You know, we, this was a project by which a number of uh, American Indian women from the Great Lakes area came to uh, three weekends of professional development workshops that were held at the Nokomis Learning Center in um, Okemos, Michigan. And by the end of those three weekends of pretty intense uh, seminars, talks, fellowship together, they decided that they would like to have an exhibition of their work and a collection of their work. Nokomis is not a collection holding institution. It's an educational institution. So we were approached by a person from the Kellogg Foundation to say, would we be willing to work with Nokomis and that group of women to help them organize an exhibition and then be a repository for the collection? Uh, we did that. Each artist chose that one work that they wanted in the collection. So essentially it was a self-curated by Native women uh, collection and exhibition. We published a book, developed a touring exhibit that went all over the state. And here's a great example of one of the pieces. Actually, it's a piece that a detail of it is shown on this uh, cover of the publication that went along with the exhibition. But it's this piece right here. And you know, it's a beautiful um, piece with uh, a group of women holding hands, encircling the, the, the uh, perimeter of this piece. Uh, the artist, Shirley Brocker, uh, she's still actively working, making pottery today. I know that she's recently made one on the uh, missing uh, Indian women. Uh, it a very important, sad, uh, contemporary issue. But anyway, this one she made specifically as her piece for this particular Sisters of the Great Lakes um, collection. They did ask if the pieces donated or acquired <laughs> with support from the Kellogg, Fund or, um, yeah, the Kellogg Foundation, if each of those pieces could go into the same cabinet so that the pieces could live together. And so we have a cabinet called Sisters of the Great Lakes um, Nokomis Collection, a cabinet here at the museum. So, so that was one project that uh, resulted in a number of acquisitions. And then we also collaborated with the Nokomis again on another exhibition, which was on powwow regalia. And we worked uh, with a photographer, an indigenous photographer, Minnie Wabanimki, who went around the state and photographed uh, powwows and paid particular attention to the kind of clothing, the regalia that was worn by the dancers at the powwows. We acquired a sampling of clothes, um, again, each piece made by uh, a person who was a dancer or a member of the dancer's family. And we're thrilled that we have that uh, collection. We did a publication, toured an exhibition, and so I think these pieces right here, yeah, made by Badabin uh, Webb Kamagid, she uh, made these small children's moccasins for dance and then these cuffs that are worn uh, by a dancer. Uh, Badabin actually worked for us for a while here at the MSU Museum and she's a local East Lansing resident. Um, her family also came from Manitoulin Island, uh, which is up in Ontario, in Canada. Um, okay, so then, uh, Point out a couple more pieces here. You saw a cabinet full of porcupine quill work. Uh, you know, we've got just a, an, an amazing collection, uh, both pieces that were donated and pieces that we acquired 
from those Master Heritage Awardees and individuals who received the Master or the Michigan Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Awards. We tried to get um, where we could a sampling of materials, a sampling of artists' work, a sampling of designs, and some of them are very traditional, like this Thunderbird image right here uh, by Bernard Parkey. Some of them, like this uh, piece of a chipmunk by uh, um, Arnold, uh, Arnold Walker, uh, so he, he has a fondness for depicting in quill work uh, animals. Um, he's really good at, at um, yeah, doing portraits of animals. And it's amazing to think that's all out of quill work. It's essentially he's painting with quills. This one right here, I think it's a grouse. Uh, it was made by his mother. Uh, Yvonne Walker Keshek, who also received a Michigan Heritage Award. And then, you know, we try to get examples of, of pieces where uh, an artist is maybe pushing the art form a little bit. And this is not at all a traditional design, but by Richard Keller. This shows he's experimenting. And so none of these traditions are completely static. They're always evolving. Now, um, when I said we, one project led to another. Let's see, did it bring it? Well, one, one project that uh, emanated was from this work, uh, because I think we were getting the reputation that of a museum that really liked to do outreach and liked to do collaborations. Uh, the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe up in Mount Pleasant approached us ab about doing oral histories with artists from their community and working on an exhibit and a publication. We did that and we acquired a few pieces that way. Um, some, you know, it really helped inform us uh, about who was active in that, that tribe. So that, though, then led to another project where, where the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa up near uh, Harbor Springs, Petoskey, uh, we embarked with them on another documentation project on contemporary living artists. And amongst the artists that were interviewed up there and photographed, um, again, by Minnie Wabanimke, interviewed by Catherine Vandekar, uh, both tribal members. Uh, it w was, you know, a, a, this duck decoy. You know, no, okay, John oh, uh, Kiwashigum. You know, the, you may look at this and think, that's not an American Indian piece, but, but we want to defy some of the stereotypes of what people are producing, and obviously, you know, decoys are used in hunting, so a waterfowl hunting. I think another interesting thing is that we try and, and get these comparative pieces of things made, you know, in our collection 100 years ago or 125, 100, almost 150 years ago, and get contemporary examples of the same form. And a good example of that is these two pieces right here, these little decorative boxes. Um, one came to us as a donation, but you know, 100 years later, 125 years later, essentially that same form is being done by contemporary Native peoples. And so we have this piece by um, Daphne Dashner here in our collections. Uh, and let's see what else here. Oh, here, uh, Patricia Shackleton. She's another recipient of both a Michigan Heritage Award and of a um, Michigan Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Award. And she does birch bark biting. 
and cutouts. And so this is all made out of birch bark. It's like a snowflake design where you fold paper and then you cut it. Or in this case, she can bite it and with scissors cut it. And so she does these lovely little designs. Um, yeah, she was on uh, Michigan State University's staff for a long time. She's retired now, living up north uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. And this is a good example of a very young person continuing traditions made by Jenny Brown. And I think we did an interview with her maybe five, six years ago now. She was, I think, 18, 19, or 20 years old, and she's making these magnificent pieces of uh, black ash basketry, another strawberry uh, basket form. And then we have quill work on a turtle shell, uh, you know, a dance uh, pouch, um, you know, with, you know, with, with, uh, um, there's, are these hooves, right? Little hooves? Yeah. And that makes sound when a dancer dances. Oh, pumpkin, punk, pumpkin, 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 uh, did does beautiful beadwork. And we have some amazing beadworkers in, in this country. Yeah. And it's based, you know, on a piece of cut out uh, copper. Her husband, David Shenaniquit, is an amazing painter. After we started doing the uh, Michigan Quilt Project, the documentation project, and we were starting to discover some of the uh, Woodlands Indian, the Anishinaabe uh, quilts made here, we were approached by somebody from the Smithsonian who heard about our work focused on native quilting and approached us about collaborating with the Smithsonian on a exhibition, well, actually major research project and leading towards an exhibition of, of quilts. Uh, we worked with a team of collaborators, um, all native peoples, uh, affiliated with the Smithsonian, and we went to powwows, we went to tribal museums, went to hoop dance contests and documented quilts made by native peoples, organized an exhibition which uh, toured across the country, and fortunately, um, the Michigan State University president at that time uh, gave us an allocation of funds so that we could acquire some quilts from each of the individuals who we interviewed and documented. And so now we have one of the best um, exhibitions or exhibitions of collections of, of native quilts in the world here. Um, and because of that project, we were also able to acquire an, a number of Anishinaabe quilts. We loaned those out to several exhibitions. We're working with uh, Zibawing again on another exhibition of, that will be focused on just the star native quilts that we have, and it will include some of the Anishinaabe quilts. And then we organized again with Zibawing or with Nokomis, a series of gatherings where of uh, basket makers, contemporary basket makers. And we invited people to come to Michigan State for a couple of days. Uh, they um, met each other, they swapped techniques, they shared materials, they shared stories, and we take recorded interviews with them. So we have all of that documentation here at Michigan State, but we also tried to acquire a number of, of pieces from them. So we have this lovely collection here, not only of Anishinaabe contemporary baskets, but of baskets from contemporary uh, basket makers across the country, native basket makers. So I think that gives you an overview of how uh, these collections have been intimately linked, especially the contemporary ones, to research-based activities, to community engagement projects, and 
um, we want to keep sustaining those relationships now in continuing to do research, but also to figure out ways to make these collections more accessible for um, the Native peoples, the communities from which these things came from. And we do that through digitization projects, photographing these collections, making them accessible online, hosting delegations to come in and help us describe more deeply, more completely the pieces. We're right now working with the uh, Zibowing Cultural Center, the Iyawing Museum, uh, which is up in Peshawar Town, Michigan, uh, the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. And then also with the, the next partner on our project is the uh, Ojibwa Cultural Foundation on Manitoulin Island, uh, the place I've mentioned several times, that uh, um, we're collaborating on a documentation project with contemporary quill workers. Minnie Wabna-Nimke is out there doing interviews. She's out there even today as we speak, um, interviewing quill workers. And we're trying to work with uh, Anishinaabewim, uh, the language of, of, of um, the peoples, indigenous peoples here in Michigan, to describe these quill boxes in that language. So if there's a particular word for porcupine, We'll have that recorded as well, all in the hopes that it will enrich our collections um, so that they can be used even more strategically, purposefully for teaching and for further research. I wanted to speak to the fact that we've had some incredible financial support uh, for all of these research and um, acquisition um, activities. They've included uh, grants from the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs, from Michigan Humanities Council, from the, um, the Kellogg Foundation, and uh, some other smaller supporters. And it's, it's just been fabulous to been able to successfully get funding for these projects. Um, it's important for us to continue to not only do the research, figure out ways to appropriately continue to appropriately care for these collections, but also to look at new strategies for using the materials in teaching and uh, outreach and things like exhibitions and publications, not only by MSU Museum staff and faculty, but students and then scholars around the world. And of course, most importantly, those members of the communities from which these objects came. So thank you.